Okay, so I will go on. In the, in the first part of this lecture, I described the two partners, the two systems which were interacting with each other, the, the atom which can be described as a spin, as a two-level system, and the field which can this which is a quantum harmonic oscillator. And I described the coupling between the two, which at present describes the exchange of one quantum between the two systems. So I will now talk about the experiments which have demonstrated this. And I will start uh, to follow a kind of historical uh, progression uh, by, by discussing the low Q regime. The first cavities that we used were not very good. And so the damping time of the field in the cavity was occurring, the damping was occurring faster than the exchange between the atom and the photon. I remind you how you can describe uh, the, the damping of a field mode in a cavity. The field intensity, which is a square of the electric field, decays exponentially with a constant, with a rate kappa. And the, the larger kappa, the, the, uh, the worse is the cavity. And in fact, you can always write kappa, which is a, which is a frequency, which is the inverse of a time, as omega, which is the angular frequency of the field in the cavity divided by Q. And Q is the quality factor. The, high, the biggest the Q, the better the cavity, the smaller the kappa. And in fact, you can Q is describes the number of radians that the field can make before the field has been damped by factor one over E. So it describes, if you have a very high Q, it means that the field can oscillate many, many times before damping. And we will see that we have Q factors which can reach a value of 10 to the 10 in our experiment, which means that you can follow in principle about 10 billion periods of the field before the field has been damped. So let's start by considering what happens if the cavity is, the Q is bad, which means that kappa is big, which means that the field will decay faster than omega naught, which is Rabi frequency. So in this case, what happens is that as soon a photon is emitted in the cavity, the photon is lost. So the photon cannot be reabsorbed later because the photon has gone away. And you see that in this case, uh, you will have a fast damping of the energy in the system. And what are the levels which uh, you have to consider? If you start from an excited atoms and zero photon, so you start with the excitation in the atom, nothing in the field. When the atom will emit one photon, it will go from E to G and one photon will appear in the cavity. But immediately this photon will be lost because of the cavity damping. So you see that in fact, the dynamics in this case is a three level system dynamics. You have to consider the, the coupling between E0, G1 and G0. And to describe this, you have to use the block equation, the equation that we discussed a long time ago. You can write the density matrix of the system, which will evolve between these three states. And I, I did not have time and don't want to enter into, into mathematical details. But when you do that, what you find is what I have written at the bottom of this slide, the probability for the atom to be excited decays exponentially with a rate gamma cal, gamma cavity. And this rate gamma cavity is proportional to, is equal to omega naught squared, the square of the Rabi frequency divided by kappa, which is just omega naught square Q over omega. So what you find is that the, the, the system go from E0 to G0 very fast. It goes in a transitory way to G1, but then goes very fast from E0 to G0 at a rate which is given by this quantity. Well, and so you see that the cavity is helping the atom to go from E to G by a term which is proportional to Q. So if you increase the Q factor, the, the, the atom will be damped faster and faster up to a point. Of course, if the Q becomes too big, then you will have oscill oscillations. So this is the low Q regime of cavity QED. 
and uh, you can now express it in a slightly different way. What, what is interesting is to compare this gamma cavity to the spontaneous emission rate in free space, which I call gamma. So I remind you that, uh, so you can omega squared is given by two d squared over epsilon h bar. This is the quantity that we wrote on the previous slide uh, before the break. You have to multiply by q and you, you get in this way gamma cap. And I remind you that gamma, the rate of spontaneous emission in free space is proportional to d square to the cube of the frequency. So you have d square omega cube in the denominator. And when you look at this ratio, you see that d square disappears. So the, the amplification of spontaneous emission does not depend on, on the dipole of the atom. And you get this quantity here, which is, of course, a dimensionless number because gamma cap, gamma cap over gamma is just a number. And you see that the enhancement rate of spontaneous emission is proportional to the Q and the quantity lambda cube over V, which is also dimensionless because lambda cube is a volume. And so you see that the enhancement of spotless emission is bigger if the Q becomes larger and it's bigger if V becomes smaller. So in fact, this shows that the surrounding of the atom is important. The environment of the atom is important. It will help the atom to radiate if it is in a cavity which is resonant with the transition, which has a good quality factor and a small volume. And this formula was in fact derived by per Purcell, who was, we all already talked about Purcell before, who is the father of the nuclear magnetic resonance. In fact, Purcell describes this formula, discusses this formula in the context of nuclear magnetic resonance. And he said a spin, which is inside the coils, within the coils which make the magnetic resonance resonant, will decay, the spin will decay faster because of the coils around it. And this is the same effect as the one that we have here. It shows that you, you can in fact tailor, you can in fact change the rate of spontaneous emission by just changing the surrounding of the atom. And this is easy to understand. If you have an atom between mirrors, when the, the dipole of the atom is oscillating, it sees its images in the mirrors. And in fact, it's emit collectively with its images. It's influenced by the images and this change the rate at which the atom is radiating. But you have this enhancement factor, which is proportional to Q over V. But of course, this enhancement occurs as long as Q is not too big. If Q exceeds a given value, then kappa will become smaller than omega naught. And then this approximation will no longer be valid. And then the photons will stay long enough to be reabsorbed by the atom. And then you enter in the regime of strong coupling between the atom and the field. And in fact, this is the regime we wanted to, to, uh, to get. In fact, so we, we try to improve the Q of our cavity to the point where we got into the strong coupling regime. And I'll show you what happens here. What, what is the condition for the strong coupling regime? What we want to have is uh, omega not larger than kappa, which means that Q has to be larger than small omega over big omega. This is the frequency, the angular frequency of the field, and this is the vacuum frequency. So the radio oscillation occurs then faster than the single photon in decay. Uh, it means that once the photon is emitted in the cavity, it can be reabsorbed because of the radio oscillation. And this can happen many times before the energy decays in the field. And you see now that you have the two regimes which are uh, shown here on the right side. On top, you see the low Q regime. So the excitation decays exponentially. But if you increase the Q sufficiently, then you get the oscillatory regime in which you have damped rabi oscillations. And if the Q still increases, the damping decreases and you get rabi oscillation, which becomes more and more uh, visible. But for that, you have to increase enough the Q of, our, of your cavity. So just to uh, 
discuss the low I will discuss very briefly the low Q regime. This is the experiment we did in 1983 to demonstrate the Purcell effect. So you see uh, the experimental setup is shown on the left. This is the low Q regime. We have a cavity which is here. The cavity is not very good. It has copper mirrors. And the cavity can be, the mirrors can be moved. There is a screw which allows you to change the length of the cavity. So you can tune the cavity in resonance with the Rydberg transition. We prepare the atom in the level 23S and we look at the transition from 23S to 22P, which occurs at 340 gigahertz. And you see here, and then when the atom have drifted out, you detect the atoms in a ramp of electric field. And you see uh, the two, these two peaks here correspond to the upper and the lower state of uh, the transition. And you see that you go from the upper state to the lower state when the cavity is at resonance. When it is off resonance, you see only one peak. When you go at resonance, you see two peaks. And we saw that for numbers of atoms becoming very, very small until you have only one atom left in the cavity. So, and I will, I will show you. You will see uh, this here. You see the signal, this is with about one atom left for each person. In fact, the, as we will see later, we, we send atoms, we send bursts of atoms through the cavity and we decrease the intensity of the lasers to the point when on average there is only one atom per pulse going through the system. And you see that even when there is only one atom, you get an enhancement of the rate of the atoms going from S to P. When you do the calculation, you find the enhancement rate you have is about 530. So it's a demonstration of the Purcell effect, the enhancement of spontaneous emission when the atoms radiate between mirrors. About at the same time, Dan Kleppner at MIT uh, did the opposite experiment, with, again with microwaves. He had the atom going through a waveguide made of two parallel mirrors and the mirrors were very close to each other. And in fact, we are interested in, in, in sent circular Rydberg atoms in which the electron is in a plane which is parallel to the mirrors. And in this case, the atom is coupled to electric fields which, which are parallel to the mirrors. And if the mirrors are too close to each other, no field can propagate through, the, uh, through this waveguide. In fact, if you plot uh, the intensity of the field between the mirrors, if the distance between the mirrors is smaller than lambda over two, no field can build up. So the gamma is zero, gamma cap is zero, and you have a big increase in the probability of, for the atom to emit when L reach the value lambda over two. Then you have a resonance and the variation of gamma cap over gamma follows this, this kind of flow. So you see that if you have an excited atom propagating between two very close spaced mirrors, it will stay, stay excited. It will not be able to radiate. And the explanation is that the images of this atom within the cavity mirrors make a field which interferes destructively with the field that the atoms want to emit. So you get an inhibition of spontaneous emission when L is smaller than lambda over two. So this is the opposite of, this is the anti-Purcell effect, inhibition of spontaneous emission between mirrors. So what, what uh, Kleppner did and his group did was to send the Rydberg atom across the gap and to vary the, this condition. In fact, he did not change the distance between the mirror. What he did is to change lambda by applying an electric field, the Stark effect changes the frequency, the resonant frequency of the atoms. And so he plotted the probability for the atom to exit the cavity 
as a function of lambda. And you see that when lambda increases, you reach a point where lambda becomes larger than uh, 2L. And at this point, no spontaneous emission can occur. So the probability for the atom to exit from the cavity still excited increases suddenly. So in fact, this is a way to, to make the atom survive longer than spontaneous emission time. And this is a kind of experiment which demonstrates the importance of the boundaries around the atom to tailor the spontaneous emission in the system in the case of a bad cavity, because of course these two parallel condenser plates have a very low Q factor. So what are the condition to achieve the strong coupling regime? We need the opposite condition to be fulfilled. So you need to have this condition. So you see immediately that what you want to have is a large, very large electric dipole. So this is what you achieve with Rydberg atoms coupled to microwave because the dipole is proportional to the square of the principal quantum number. You need to have a very large Q factor. So this is what you will get with superconducting cavities in the microwave domain. You want to have a very small cavity volume. And so you want a cavity whose volume is just a few lambda cube. You want to have a, in the microwave domain, lambda is of the order of one centimeter. So you have a cavity whose volume is about one cubic centimeter. And you have to send the atoms across this kind of cavity. So this is the solution. You, you just couple a circular Rydberg atom in a superconducting cavity, which is made of two uh, mirrors, uh, which have a niobium superconducting layer on top of the, of the mirrors. And I will describe that in a moment. So I have already discussed before the orders of magnitude of the circular Rydberg atom. It's just a, the wave function is just a torus, which has a radius A naught N squared. This is the closest uh, you can get from the Bohr atom of the old quantum theory. And the resonant condition, you, you can describe this as a kind of De Broglie wave going around the nucleus. And the principal quantum number is the number of De Broglie wavelengths within the circumference. And so this is the atom. And how do you prepare this atom? The technique to prepare circular Rydberg atom had been pioneered by Dan Kleppner at MIT at the time of the experiment I described to you before. And I just give you a flavor of the way it is done. What you want to do is to have at the same time a very excited atom, so a lot of energy just below the ionization limit. And you want to also to have the maximum value of the angular momentum. So you, you start by exciting with optical photons. You go, for example, this is the case of rubidium from 5S to 5P, then to, 5, to 5D. And then with the third laser, you get to 52F state. And at this point, you are in a readback state, but you have a low angular momentum because three photons cannot give you more than two or three units of angular momentum, but you want to get 51 units of angular momentum. So the trick is to apply an electric field and to lift the degeneracy of the manifold, N equal to 52 manifold with this electric field, the Stark effect. And what the theory tells you is that the energy levels in the small electric field organize themselves to give a kind of triangular energy diagram. For low angular momentum, you have a lot of levels which are equidistant. And as you increase the angular, as you increase the, uh, the projection of the angular momentum on the continuation axis, you have less and less levels. And when you reach the circular state, you have only one level left because there is only one way you can get this maximum state is by giving to the angular momentum the maximum value. And so what you have to do once you are here is to apply radio frequency field, which are resonant with the, all these transitions and which you bring you continuously from this state to that state. I don't describe in detail what how you do it. And we have studied this process in details. 
what you have to remember is that the light photons provide the energy and the radio frequency photons provide the angular momentum. It looks, it's the same, similar to what uh, people do when they send a satellite around the Earth. You first put it on orbit, and then with small rockets, you can modify the eccentricity of the orbit, and that is to change the angular momentum. And when you are here, you still have some atoms which are left in non-circular states, but to purify, you apply a microwave field, which brings you from 52 to 51. This state is a pure circular state, and we checked that we indeed are able to prepare with 99% probabilities uh, the atoms in pure circular state. We need to do something else too. We need to control the velocity of these atoms. These atoms are propagating on an atomic beam, and we want we prepare the atom by a pulse of laser, the laser pulse, and then we detect them later by applying the ramp of electric field. So the velocity of the atom is important because it tells you at what time the atom was inside the cavity and how long it spent it into the cavity. So we have to control the velocity. And to do that, we use the Doppler effect. If you, use, if you excite with lasers which make an angle with the atomic beam, by using the Doppler effect, you can filter atoms which have a well-defined velocity along the beam direction. And you see here the results that we finally obtained. The green curve is the velocity distribution if you don't select the velocity. That is what the way you measure the green curve is to prepare the atom at a given point and see and detect when they arrive at the detector. So you find the velocity in this way and you find that you have a broad distribution which is a Maxwell thermal distribution. But if you select the velocity, you see now that you can take just the atoms, which has a well-defined velocity. And by changing the Doppler detuning, you can scan the velocity of the atom across this distribution. And so you can control the velocity of the atoms which cross the cavity. A few words about the cavity itself. You see the cavity is made of two parts which are mounted together. You see here one, the lower mirror. The mirrors are machined in, in copper. And the, the copper is a metal which can be machined very precisely. So you, you, you can have a, a spherical surface with irregularities which are much smaller than the microwave frequency. You have a few nanometer uh, irregularities which make it a very good mirror. But the, Copper has a resistivity because it's a normal metal. So on top of this very smooth surface, we sputter a very thin layer of niobium. The niobium is a metal which is superconducting at low temperature. So it has no losses. And so you have a very, very well-defined geometry and a very uh, low resistance mirror. So you have a very good uh, mirror here. You see these posts are placed on piezoelectric support, which means that you can, by applying an electric field to this piezo, you can change very smoothly the distance between the mirrors. And the top, you, you have the, the other part, which is a top mirror, which is symmetrical. And when you put them together, you have a narrow gap between the mirror, which is the place where the atoms are flying across. And of course, these mirrors have to be kept at a very low, less than one Kelvin, so they are at the bottom of the cryostat to keep the system very cold. And with these mirrors, we got the best uh, cavity we got had the damping time of more than one tenth of a second, which corresponds to a Q factor of more than 10 to the 10, 10 billion. Uh, what it means uh, in terms of the mirrors are about three centimeter apart. So having 130 milliseconds, it means that the light, if you consider a photon as a particle bouncing between the mirrors, the particle could bounce for 40,000 kilometers between these mirrors, bouncing 10 billion times. So it is as if light was going around the Earth during the time the field stays inside this cavity. So here I, I precise the orders of magnitude. You see these two lines, these are the cavity mirrors, and you have nine, you have a standing wave with nine antinodes between the mirrors. 
So the, the mirrors is the distance in the mirror is nine lambda over two, 2.7 centimeter. And uh, the uh, factor, the important factor is the Rabi frequency over the frequency of the field. If you put the figures together, you find a dimensionless quantity, which is about 10 minus six. It means that the Rabi frequency is 10 minus six times the uh, microwave frequency. The microwave frequency is 50 gigahertz. It means that the Rabi frequency is 50 kilohertz. So these are the order of magnitude. You have about 1 million Rabi flops during uh, uh, the uh, damping time of the cabin. No, the number of Rabi flops during the cavity damping time is about 5,000 if you compute this quantity. So in fact, you see that the atom and the photon can exchange 5,000 times before the feed is damped. Uh, the atom cavity interaction time depends of course on the atom velocity. And you will see that it can vary from 20 microseconds to about one millisecond. So you can change this time by just changing the velocity of the atoms. And finally, I show here that we are indeed in a strong coupling regime. You have one over omega is three ten minus six seconds, and the damping time is ten minus one second. So you see that we have a lot of space between the Rabi plotting time and the cavity damping time. The interaction time is somewhere in between. So to summarize. This is a system that we have to consider. We have the cavity field, the Rydberg, a circular Rydberg atom crossing the cavity. In the best mirror, uh, we, we claim that these are the best mirror in the world because the light can bounce more than uh, one billion times between the mirror and the, uh, the photons are trapped for more than one tenth of a second between these mirrors. And we, this system, is realizing this uh, ideal system of a two level atom coupled to a field oscillator inside the cavity. So, what one atom interacts with one or a few photons in a box, and uh, I just show you here how it works. You see the atoms, you see the atoms are going one by one, and then they are detected downstream by the field ionization process. Again, I show it again. And you collect the information. Each time the atom reaches the detector, you know whether the atom is in state P or in state G. So you get a binary information for each atom crossing the system. And this is the way we collect data in the system. We have two set, we have had two setups over the years. The setup I, am, I have just described to you is a setup in which the atoms are going horizontally with velocity selection. And we select the velocity between 200 and 300 meters per second, which gives an interaction time of the order of up to 100 microseconds. So there, there is a mistake in the notes, it's not milliseconds, it's 100 microseconds. So if you want to go to have a longer interaction time, we change the setup. And instead of having an horizontal setup, we build a vertical setup. And you remember this kind of geometry, which is the atomic fountain geometry. We have a, a magnetic optical trap at the bottom with rubidium atoms. And then we push the atom with a laser up. The atoms go up very slowly. And when they get inside the cavity, we apply the radio frequency field, which transforms them into circular atoms. And we have circular atoms crossing the cavity at a low speed, and the interaction time then can reach one millisecond. The atoms are going a few meters per second, and they take a few, one or a few milliseconds to cross the cavity. And then we detect them upstairs. So, what did we get with this setup? This is the first Rabi signal we obtained in 1996 with the horizontal setup. And you see that we indeed have several oscillations. They are damped. 
because the, uh, the atom spent a short time in the cube, the cavity was not uh, was good, but not was not as good as one I just described to you before. So this was the association in 1996. Then many years later, we when we use the slow beam of atoms, laser cooled atoms, you see now we can see more than 20 rabi oscillations and the system is really oscillating between zero and one photon continuously so this this signal uh, illustrates the advantage of laser cooling you see with, with cold atoms you, you can observe these rabi oscillation at a much longer time scale now there are two kinds of fields you can investigate with this setup. You can work with photon number states. For example, if you start with the atom in the state E and let the system evolve during half a rabi oscillation, the system goes from E0 to G1, and then you get one photon. And next week, I will show you techniques to get not only one, but you can get two, three, four, five photons. It's, this is called a Fox state, a state which has a well-defined photon number. So this is a first, this is a really quantum state which has quantum properties. But for some experiments, you want to work with a different kind of field with coherent states. What is a coherent state? A coherent state is a state which is a superposition of photon number states. And if you increase, if you have a distribution of photon number states, then according to the Heisenberg uncertainty relation, you will have a field which will have a well-defined phase. You decrease <coughs> the knowledge on the photon number, you increase the knowledge of the phase. And the classical field is precisely a field which has a well-defined amplitude and a well-defined phase because of uh, 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 compromising, getting the best compromise between amplitude and phase fluctuations. And how do you get this current field? It's a classical technique. You have a horn, you have a source of microwaves, which radiates a classical microwave on, on the setup. And you see a few photons will be scattered on the edge of the mirror and they will fall in the cavity. And once they are in the cavity, you can switch off the source and you get a field which will be damped away with a time constant of one second, one tenth of a second. So it's, it's a little bit like uh, ringing a bell. You just send a short pulse of my classical microwave and you get a long ringing before the field decays and this field has characteristics which are quite different from a photon number state because they have a well-defined phase on, on the next slide i briefly recall the properties of coherent states this the theory of coherent state has been uh, described by Roy Glauber, who uh, won a Nobel Prize in 2005 because he was a pioneer of theoretical quantum optics. He described the difference between Fox state and coherent state, and he made a very complete analysis of the coherent state. As I, I don't want to get into the details of the derivation that you have on this slide, but I want to give you the physical insight. A coherent state has a compromise between uh, the energy and the phase. And if you go in the Fresnel plane, you see a coherent state will be represented by a kind of small uncertainty circle. And you see in this circle, you have an uncertainty in the amplitude that is in the photon number, and you have an uncertainty of the phase. And this is the best compromise. And in fact, such a coherent field is nothing but the vacuum field. The vacuum field has also uncertainties in amplitude and phase and is centered at the origin of the Fresnel plane, but the co a coherent state with a given amplitude is just a translated vacuum field. You start from the vacuum field and you give it a push in the Fresnel plane that you give it an amplitude and it will keep the same uncertainty, but away from, from the origin. Another way to look at it is to remind ourselves that classically uh, an electric the electric field of a light field, monochromatic light field, is just a point at, at the tip of a vector. And the coherent field is just a vector which has a fuzzy uh, tip because of this 
uncertainties. But of course, the size of this uncertainty is always the same, which means that if you increase the number of photons, the phase will be more and more precise, and you will get a field which will be more and more classical. In fact, here I'm talking about what happens with a few photons, but a classical field has billions of photons, so you can completely forget about the fluctuations if you are very far away from the origin of this plane. On, on this part, I just want to show you from where all this, the formulas that we're using are coming. Uh, I just told you that a coherent field is just a translated vacuum field. And I also remind you that the translation operator for the fictitious harmonic oscillator, which is equivalent to our field, is something that we have encountered already in the lectures. If you want to translate by X, a wave function, what you do is that you, might, you apply the operator, which is exponential of two minus I X P, where P is a momentum operator. And if you want to translate in any direction, not either around X or P, what you have to do is just to apply the operator, which is an exponential of alpha, where alpha is X plus I P. And it amounts to apply the operator alpha a dagger minus alpha star a. It's a, it's a linear combination of x and p, which you can translate into a linear combination of a and a dagger. So you have this formula, and you have to apply this operator on vacuum. So you have to apply this exponential of a sum of operator on the vacuum. So classically, if it were not an operator, the exponential of a sum is a product of exponential. But you have to be careful because A and A dagger do not commute. So in fact, the theory shows that you can cut the exponential into two terms, but you have to add here this E minus alpha square over two term. And you see that you get this expression. And you have here the operator E minus alpha star A acting on the vacuum. There is a mistake in the notes. I forgot the star here. But you see this operator, the action of this operator is very simple. What is E minus alpha star A? You can expand it. So it's one plus alpha star A plus alpha square A square over two square root over uh, uh, factorial two and so on. If you expand it, you find that only the one term counts because A acting on vacuum gives zero. So you see that this part is just zero. And then you have E alpha A dagger acting on zero. If you expand, you will find A dagger acting on zero, which is one, A dagger squared acting on zero, which is two, and so on. And you get an expansion over the end state by using the property of the fact that the exponential of uh, uh, the expansion of an exponential is something very simple. So in fact, you see that the coherent state is just a sum of n state with this amplitude factors here. I, I don't, this is just to give you an idea. Uh, if you are interested in demonstrating this formula, the fact that you have the exponential of a sum is given by a product of exponential plus this term, you have to use this identity, which is valid provided that the operators A and B commute with a commutator. And this quantity is called the Glauber formula. And if you really want to have it demonstrated, you go on the internet and you have many demonstrations of this formula of quantum optics. But the bottom line is that a coherent state, a state which has a well-defined phase, is a superposition of n state with a distribution of the n values given by this law, which is a Poisson law which is a law which has a maximum for a given end state, as we will see shortly. So I summarize on the next slide what happens if n is small. You see, so I repeat the formula here. The probability to have n photon is, of course, the square of the amplitude that you have here. And you find that the probability to have n photon is given by this formula. And if you uh, look, if you compute this and look at the, at the average, you find that alpha, that the average photon number is just alpha squared. 
So this is a formula which is an average corresponding to alpha squared. And the width, that is the fluctuation around the average, is just alpha square root of n. So this is a distribution which has a, a, a fluctuation, which is the square root of the photon number. And this is something that we have already discussed in a different context when I talked about the Heisenberg energy, uh, time energy uncertainty. Another point which is also very important is how does this coherent state evolve in time? If you want to look at the time evolution, you have to take uh, the unitary operation which describes the time evolution, which is just the exponential of the energy. And you see that this amounts to multiplying the nth term alpha to the n by e minus i n plus one half h bar omega. So you see that in fact, what you do is the evolution in time is just changing alpha into alpha e minus i omega t. So it means that this uh, superposition of n state is rotating in the final plane without changing its shape. So you find that this is really the property of a classical coherent state. And also the last point I show you here is that delta n over n bar is one over square root of n, which is again something that I already said that if you increase the photon number, the relative fluctuation becomes smaller and smaller and you get a field which looks more and more classical. So this is, these formulas are quite simple, but I just wanted to recall them here. This slide I will just skip. It is, if you are interested, you can look into it. It just tells you how do you get a coherent state in the cavity. It tells you that if you couple the cavity to a classical source, you get a coherent field whose amplitude increases linearly with time. This, if, you, if you apply a source of uh, microwave and which feed the cavity by a coherent field, this field will increase with an amplitude alpha proportional to time. And you can find this from these expressions here, which uh, describe the Hamiltonian, the unitary operation, which describe the increase of the field in the cavity. So this is just to make the connection with the slide I showed you at the beginning. If you want to feed the current state in the cavity, you just couple it for a given time to the source and the current field has an amplitude which is proportional to the time you, you get it on. Last point in the last couple of minutes, how do you, what, what are the quantum features that you recognize when you uh, have a coherent field acting on an atom? What I have written here is the probability for the atom to go from level E to level G when the atom is submitted to, to a coherent field. You see that the rabiociation becomes more complicated. If you have in an end state, it's quite clear you have an omega square root of n rabiociation, which is continuous and which brings the atom from E to G regularly back and forth. But if you have a superposition of end states, the rabi frequencies are proportional to omega square root of n, so omega square root of n plus one and so on. And all these frequencies are incommensurate with each other, which means that when you compute the sum of this, the sum of cosine function with amplitude, which depend on n, the, the rabiociation will be blurred after some time because the oscillation with n and n plus one will no longer be in phase after a very short time. So after a short time, all these oscillation will be blurred away and the oscillation will decay. And if you wait long enough, suddenly after some time, the oscillation will revive. This is called the quantum collapse and revival of the rabi oscillation, which is just comes from the fact that you are looking at the probability, which is a sum of probabilities with uncommensurate frequencies. And on this slide, I show you, I can give you briefly an explanation for the time it takes for the oscillation to collapse and the time it takes for revive. 
So what is the collapse time? You look, what is the dispersion? What you have to look at is the dispersion of Rabi frequencies over the width of this Poisson distribution. So you have to compute delta omega square root of n plus one. The derivative of this is just uh, one over square root of n plus one. When you derivate square root of n plus one over n, you get one over square root of n plus one times square root of n plus one. This is delta n. And so finally, you get a dispersion which is of the order of omega naught. The dispersion of the frequencies over the distribution is omega naught, which means that after a time of the order of one over omega naught, you will have a complete destruction of, of the oscillation because the oscillation which are due to the fast to the largest n value will be completely out of phase with the oscillation corresponding to the lowest n value. And so you see that the time of collapse is about pi over omega naught, which means that you will see about square root of n oscillations. And you see here with n equal 25, you see three or four or five oscillations before it's done to it. But now, why does it revive? It revives because after some long time, the oscillation corresponding to n and n plus one will have changed by two pi. So if the difference between the oscillation of n of n and n plus one of the Rabi frequencies corresponding to n and n plus one potent is equal to two pi, then all the terms in this sum will be again back in phase. And this calculation shows very easily that the revival time is of the order of square root of n time longer than the collapse. And here, it means that about five or six collapse time, you have a revival. So this is quite simple explanation. It comes from the fact that, in fact, you have a, you have a distribution of frequencies, but they are discrete frequencies. It's classically, you would expect that the amplitude of the field could vary continuously. It's not the case. The amplitude of the field varies by discrete values, and this explains why this will collapse and then revive. So this is a, a signature of the graininess of the discrete values that the electric field can take. And so this, this is a quantum effect. In fact, the, the fact that this is a quantum effect can be understood if you want to see what is a classical limit. What would you happen? What would happen to the classical limit? The classical limit means that you have a very large number of photons. But of course, you want to have a Rabi oscillation, which remains finite. Omega square root of n is just the classical Rabi oscillation, the one that we used in, that we encountered in, in the previous lectures. So what does it mean if n goes to infinity? And if you want omega square root of n to be finite, it means that omega naught has to go to zero. So the classical limit is a very large photon number and very small vacuum frequency. And omega naught goes to zero, especially simply because of the volume of quantization classically has to go to infinity. So V becomes infinite, but the ratio of, uh, of uh, the square root of N over V remains finite. So, and then you get omega classical. But if omega goes to zero, it means that the times of collapse goes to infinity. So you don't have a collapse anymore. The, you, you get a continuous Rabi oscillation, which is the one you had in the previous lectures. Classically, the Rabi oscillation does not end, does not collapse, and does not revive. Collapse and revive comes from the fact because you have small photon numbers and the graininess of the field becomes important. Just on the last two slides, I show you the first signal that we got in 1996, we had not so such a good cavity and we could do that only with very small photon number. You see here the Rabi oscillation in vacuum and you see how the Rabi oscillation is perturbed when you have an average photon number which increased from zero to 0 0.4, 0 0.8, 1.7. And you see, you, you, you have a hint that the signal is collapsing and then after a time reviving a little bit. When you take the Fourier transform of this signal, you get peaks at omega naught, omega naught square root of two, square root of three, and so on. And from the amplitude of these peaks, you can reconstruct something which looks like a Poisson distribution. So we had the first hint 
of the fact that we had uh, this kind of distribution in a field containing very small photon numbers. Then when we resume these experiments much later on with cold atoms, you get something which is much cleaner. You see here clearly the signal in which the radiociation disappears. And then you have a long idle time where you, they're all out of phase. So on average, you have a probability one half for the atom to be E or in G. And then the OC addition revives. And if you take the Fourier transform of this curve, you get what I show you here. You get peaks corresponding to discrete numbers of photons. And the envelope of these peaks give you the Poisson distribution. So you see that you can experimentally show that a coherent state has a Poisson distribution of the photon number by just analyzing the radiociation and its Fourier transform. And so this, this experiment shows that we control well uh, the field in the cavity, either a Fox state, I show you the vacuum radiociation, or a current field, I show you the oscillation with the collapse and revival. Next week, we will see how we can use all this to do interesting physics, entanglement, quantum gates, and so on. I just conclude by these remarks. So in this lecture, I have described the tools of cavity QED. So we use circular Rydberg atom and a cavity field, which can be prepared in pure quantum number states or in coherent state. We have studied the interaction between the atom and the field at resonance, and we have distinguished between the low Q and the high Q regime. In the first case, the system evolves irreversibly in the cavity, which enhances or inhibits atomic spontaneous emission. And in the latter case, called strong coupling regime, the atom and the field reversibly exchange energy, giving rise to radiociations. If the cavity is initially empty, the oscillation corresponds to the periodic emission and reabsorption of a single photon. And if the cavity initially stores a current field, the radiociation exhibits collapses and revivals due to the discreteness of the field energy. In the next lecture, we will see how the atom field interaction can generate entanglement between atom and field and how one can realize quantum gates between atomic and field qubits. And I will also study the non-resonant regime of cavity QED. What happens if the atom is not resonant anymore? In this case, the cavity induces light shifts on the atom. And these light shifts produced by single photons can be used to count the photons without destroying them, which is a quantum non-demolition measurement. So stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs>